was worth the wait. <laughs> I think we'll start. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Webster. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here. Boy, you can tell it's a long weekend. Uh, lots of people away. I hope they're enjoying this beautiful sunny day as, as we will this afternoon, I'm sure. Uh, my name is Michael Webster. I'm filling in for Reverend Shelley every once in a while. And uh, I'm glad, as always, to be here. Joined by Sherry, who's desperately trying to get us uh, online. Um, looks like Molly on the PowerPoint. We've got Warren on the piano, and Cornelia's going to help with the drumming. We've got a bunch of us here, and we're all set to go, finally. As we begin, uh, we want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge this day and, and the land, uh, this beautiful land on which we live and gather to worship uh, the wide prairie sky and the bright prairie sunshine uh, to acknowledge the, uh, the First Nations of this place, the peoples who have lived here since time immemorial, and also to, uh, to affirm that we are all treaty people, bound by the understandings made in the agreement known as Treaty 6. Also, this morning we want to begin by lighting this candle. I'm going to talk a little bit later about, uh, about Jesus as the, uh, as the lamp from which shines the light of God. But before that, we want to uh, invite the presence of Christ officially among us by the lighting of this, this Christ candle, a light that symbolizes for us the light of Christ, which a light which shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Thanks be to God. I'm going to bring us into a time of worship with these words. People of God, we are gathered here this morning, united in worship. Here are people we know, friends and neighbors, people who come every Sunday and always sit in the same pew. And here are people we hardly know, visitors in person and, I hope soon, online, people who are maybe not quite sure where to sit. People of God, people, each one made in the image of God. In me, in you, in each of us, the Spirit of God shines through for all to see. So, people of God, come. Let us join in worship. And let us join our opening prayer. Our prayer of approach is uh, from Psalm 67, as we say together, Be gracious unto us, O God, and bless us. Let the light of your face shine upon us. May your ways be known upon the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the earth yield its harvest, the fields their bounty. Your blessing, O God, be upon us. Amen. And now some uh, announcements, uh, what's going on in this congregation. Uh, important announcement to make is that the Angle Annual Congregational Meeting will be held next Sunday, May 29th. Uh, there'll be an abbreviated worship service at 1030 as usual, uh, followed by the meeting. It's an important meeting. I encourage you to, to make time for it. Also, what else is going on? Uh, lots of stuff this week. Uh, coffee time is this week. That's Thursday at 10 o'clock in person right here. The uh, book, no, the book club is not yet, but they're reading The Other Side of the River from a Church Pew to Sweat Lodge by the Reverend Alf Dumont. Um, and something else was this week. Junior Youth Group. Oh, yeah, Junior Youth Group is meeting this Friday, May 27th, uh, at I'm not sure what time. And that's for, from grades 5 to 8. So, uh, and that's not something you have to already belong to. If you know someone in grades five to eight, you can invite them to come this Friday evening for the youth group. Uh, and if you wanted to bring along some snacks with you, you know, grades five to eight, they can't get enough snacks. So think about that. Uh, the Forever in Motion uh, exercise group started on Friday uh, and goes for five more Fridays. You don't have to have been to the first one. You can just come to the next one uh, every Friday. At, uh, at 9.30. And... Can't really see much. Did I forget anything? 
Oh, the flowers, thank you. The flowers uh, are from uh, the memorial service for the Reverend Jack Carr, which was held here yesterday at, at 2 o'clock. A beautiful uh, arrangement of flowers in memory of Jack, for which we are grateful. Okay, let's sing. It's Let Us Build a House. We'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. to uh, all of you who are joining us online. We had a little uh, glitch this morning, but uh, Sherry has worked her magic and, and uh, we're back online, so I'm told. Yes, we are. Uh, so welcome also to you. And we just got to, uh, to the celebrations and concerns. Um, I would ask you if you're, if you're wanting to share anything uh, that's uh, good in your life or good in the world, you want to... Uh, Everybody to share and knowing about. I, I of course, uh, would want to celebrate the uh, the life and ministry of Jack Carr, um, someone whom I knew to, and I said this before, to be a wise and gentle man, and uh, certainly uh, greatest respect for him, and celebrate the work that he has done in in this congregation and elsewhere as well as we heard on on Friday. Any other celebrations? Anybody want to celebrate this long weekend or? Sun is shining. It's going to get warmer. It really is. I've been saying that for a month, but it's true. Maybe it'll be true eventually. <laughs> no? Uh, concerns. I have, uh, I have a, a few here. This is a, uh, <clears throat> a young woman named Juline uh, who's looking for a safe, affordable uh, 
a rental place for herself. Um, she's just gotten out of an abusive relationship and so she needs a place to stay uh, permanently. Um, also, um, uh, Lisa, who's um, had her back operation delayed, and, uh, and Lisa's daughter-in-law, um, who's dealing with a, a trauma situation. And so we hold those women in our prayers. Are there other concerns you would like to raise at this point? But oh, that's good, isn't it? That's good if we don't have all this, a lot of concerns. Okay. <clears throat> at this time, then, <clears throat> I would invite you to, uh, to stand in your place if you're able and in a socially distanced way to pass the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Okay, time for <clears throat> some time with the young people. <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice. I wanted to talk uh, with this morning about hands. Hands. Isn't it great to have hands? They're so useful. We can do so many things with our hands. Uh, we can hold a pencil with them, and, oh, just all kinds of stuff. And one of the great things about human hands is our thumbs. Uh, our thumbs are really quite wonderful. They can move all over the place, and they're what they're called opposable thumbs, which means that we can grab onto things like that. Um, but like, like your dog or your cat can't do that. Horses and cows can't do that. Uh, but people can do that. We have thumbs that are over, over there instead of tied up over there. Now, it turns out that all of our close relatives have opposable thumbs, like chimpanzees and great apes and orangutans, they all have uh, opposable thumbs. But theirs aren't quite as good as ours, because our thumbs can reach way over. I can touch my, my pinky with my thumb, or I can even touch the base of my pinky with my thumb. I can touch all of my fingers. Uh, and chimpanzees and orangutans and apes can't do that. Their thumbs can only get over to about the middle finger. So they're much, they move around a lot better uh, than anything else. On the other hand, the chimpanzees and the apes and the orangutans, they have opposable big toes. So their big toe is like a, like a thumb, so they can, with their feet, they can grab onto something like that. So that's why they can hang upside down on branches like that, because their feet will hang on just like their hands can, which doesn't do you any good if you're wearing shoes. Anyway, hands are wonderful things. Oh, we can, uh, when I was in Alaska, I learned how to use my hands to remember all the different kinds of salmon they have there, the fish, salmon, uh, because they have five different kinds of salmon, and you can use your fingers to remember them. Um, you can use your thumb to remind you of chum salmon, because it rhymes. Thumb rhymes with chum. And you can use your index finger. Uh, this isn't very nice. You can think about poking somebody in the eye. So that reminds you of sockeye salmon. Uh, and your tallest finger uh, reminds you of king salmon. And this finger is your ring finger. You would, might put a silver ring on your finger, so that reminds you of silver salmon. And then your pinky reminds you of pink salmon. So chum, sockeye, kim, king, silver, and pink. The five kinds of salmon. Hands are just great for so many things. People, uh, we even kind of talk, I, I talk with my hands a lot. Uh, we use our hands to talk, and, and, and sometimes we don't even have to talk. Like if I go, if I go like this, that means I'm glad to see you. Or if I widen my hands out, that means give me a hug. Or uh, if I go, that means no more thanks, I'm full. Uh, we can use all kinds of, uh, and of course, people who are hard of hearing or who are deaf, 
they use the whole language with their hands. American Sign Language, AMSLAM, they call it. And uh, I, I, I used to know sign language, but now I forget. Uh, but still, I know how to spell in sign language. Everybody, I think, should know how to spell in sign language. You know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. <laughs> and on it goes. <clears throat> if, if I wanted to spell Mayfair, uh, I would go M, A, I, no, <laughs> M, A, Y, <laughs> F, A, I, R. That's really slow. If you see people on TV signing, they're spelling, they're just, their fingers are just a blur. I can't keep up. I'm not that good. Anyway, but even if you don't know a language uh, in, with your hands, we, we signal all kinds of stuff with our hands. You can say, uh, give me a call, or you can say, uh, I'll, I'll meet you over there, you know, and people will understand what you, what you mean. All kinds of, of things like that. You can say, uh, Live long and prosper. <laughs> Live long and prosper, you know, with your hands. <coughs> or you can say, I love you. And that's, that's from sign language. That's the I for I and the L for love and the Y for you. And you put it together and it's I love you. And, or now I see people go going like that a lot. I love you. So lots of ways we can communicate with our hands. And of course, as, as people who really care about Jesus and about the things that Jesus taught, uh, we can use our hands to be kind to other people. We can give somebody a pat on the back, or uh, we, could, uh, we could make something for somebody. Um, I know a woman who makes, uh, who makes toques, who makes warm hats for homeless people. And she makes uh, hundreds of them every year. Uh, she uses her hands to, to crochet. Or you can wrap a gift. That's kind of fun to wrap a gift and tie some ribbon around it and all that, you know? That's kind of fun. What else? Um, you can encourage somebody. You can give them a wave to make them feel good or, or okay, you're doing good. Or thumbs up, nice job, you know? All those kinds of things. You could write a letter. You could use your hands to write a, a card, maybe a birthday card or a get well card or something like that or just a card to say, hi, thinking about you. Or, I'll tell you something that grown-ups really like. You can draw a picture. All grown-ups love to get a hand-drawn picture that a kid made. So if you want to do something nice for somebody, you can draw a picture, crayons or pencils, draw a picture, maybe a picture of you in your backyard or something, doing something, maybe a picture of a bird in a tree, it doesn't matter, uh, and, and give that to a grown-up person, and they just love that. So... Lots of ways to use our hands for good. So you'll never guess what we're going to sing now. Some of you may already have guessed. We're going to sing, Jesus' hands were kind hands.
The revelation of John was written at a time when Christians were being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. So I read from Revelations. He took me in a spirit-inspired trance to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The city had God's glory. Its brilliance was like a priceless jewel, like jasper that was as clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. By the gates were 12 angels, and on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons. I didn't see a temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is vile and deceitful, but only those who are registered in the Lamb's scroll of life. The second reading is from John. In Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate in the North City Wall, is a pool with the Aramaic name Bethsaida. It had five covered porches and a crowd of people who were sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed sat there. A certain man was there who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, knowing that he had already been there a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I don't have anyone who can put me in the water when it is stirred up. When I'm trying to get into it, someone else has gotten in ahead of me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately the man was well and he picked up his mat and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Thanks, Kathy. Nice to done. Well, <clears throat> I've been singing all week. I've been thinking about those, these readings, and these readings have got me singing, and I've been singing all my favorite music, which is to say spirituals, the blues, and Broadway show tunes. The reading from John's Gospel is about a pool of water in Jerusalem. It was believed at that time that every once in a while an angel would stir up the water and when that happened, the first person to get into the water would be healed of their infirmity. And when I think about that, I sing. And what I sing is, Wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water. The Lord's going to trouble the water. You probably know that, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, of course, that, uh, that song was written by and first sung by African slaves in the American South. It's a, it's a spiritual. It clearly refers to today's reading, stirring up the water. But like a number of these slave songs, it also had another meaning, a secret meaning uh, to for, for slaves, escaping slaves, seeking freedom in the north, uh, it was a reminder to wade in the water, to throw off the scent of the dog, so to slow down their pursuers. Today's reading from Revelation is about the city of heaven. 
And that reminds me of an old-time street singer and street preacher from Harlem named Gary Davis. He wrote songs that were recorded by groups as diverse as Peter, Paul, and Mary and the Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan, Taj Mahal. If you liked his blues songs, you called him Blind Gary Davis because he, he was blind from infancy. If you liked his religious music, you called him Reverend Gary Davis because he was an ordained Baptist minister. When I think about the city of heaven, I start singing, Oh, what a beautiful city. Oh, what a beautiful city. Oh, what a beautiful city. Twelve gates to the city. Hallelujah. Like that. Gary Davis. I agree with blind Reverend Gary Davis. I call him both because I like all of his music. I agree with him that the idea that there are 12 gates to the city of heaven is very important. And I'm going to tell you why I think that. But first, I want to tell you something about something I read recently by Oscar Hammerstein II. Oscar, Oscar Hammerstein II. He is the Hammerstein of Rogers and Hammerstein, which you may remember are the, the pair that, uh, that wrote and produced many of the... Uh, I guess what we would call classic Broadway musical shows. So, um, I mean, just to name a few, South Pacific, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. Remember that? You have to be like, you know, old to remember that. But anyway, uh, The King and I, that was a movie. You might have seen that. Um, so, hello, young lovers, wherever you are, and uh, getting to know you, getting to know all about you, that my favorite, Oklahoma. Um, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. You know, uh, and everybody, I think it's everybody's favorite. Uh, chicks and geese and ducks better scurry when they see me out in the Surrey. You know that. But if none of that means anything to you, how about the sound of music? That one. The next time you see Julie Andrews twirling around a mountain meadow. The hills are alive. You know, uh, Oscar Hammerstein wrote those words and, and many, many more. Anyway, what I want to share with you with this morning uh, that was written by Oscar Hammerstein uh, is from an essay he wrote way back in the 1950s. Now, I know that's a long time ago, um, and I had to kind of clean up some of the sexist language that was used at the time. Um, but... I think that what he's got to say, what he said then, is even more relevant now than when he said it. This is how he begins. I have an unusual statement to make. I am someone who believes he is happy. What makes it unusual is that people who are happy seldom tell anyone. Unhappy people are more communicative. They are eager to recite what is wrong with the world, and they seem to have a talent for gathering a large audience. Does that sound like 2022 to you? Does that remind you of a certain former American president? Would you agree with me that social media has made it easier for people to express their unhappiness and to gather an even larger audience for it? Well... Why would he believe he is happy, says Hammerstein. After all, he writes, death has deprived me of many whom I loved. Dismal failure has followed many of my most earnest efforts. People have disappointed me. I have disappointed them. I have disappointed myself. From all this evidence and more, could I not build up a strong case to prove why I am not happy at all? Well... I think we could all build a case to prove our unhappiness if we wanted to, to frame our lives in terms of death and disappointment, to picture our lives in, in terms of trouble and hardship. Hmm. But for Hammerstein, that would be a false picture. As false, he writes, as describing a tree only as it is in the winter. I would be leaving out, he writes, a list of people I love who have not died, 
I will be leaving out an acknowledgement of the many successes that have sprouted, sprouted among my many failures. I will be leaving out the blessing of good health, the joy of walking in the sunshine. I will be leaving out my faith that the goodness of humanity will triumph eventually. I think Hammerstein's got a point. And so I want to declare to you this morning that I am happy. I am happy. And it's true, like Hammerstein, the tree of my life has endured a few winters. It's also true that I have benefited from much good fortune and from being a person of privilege. And yet privilege doesn't necessarily make a person happy. Again, I think of that former American president who is, has enormous wealth and privilege and has gathered an enormous audience to hear how unhappy he is. So happiness, it seems to me, has less to do with our circumstances and more to do with our attitude about our circumstances. Do we see the tree of our life in winter or do we see it in full leaf? Both are true, both are backed up by evidence, I'm sure. And I'm not suggesting we should deny winter. I mean, we live in Saskatchewan, we can't really deny winter. But in many ways, being happy is a choice. We can choose to be happy, sometimes because of our circumstances and sometimes in spite of our circumstances. The fellow in today's gospel reading doesn't seem very happy at all. And not just because he's handicapped in some way. Jesus asks him a straightforward question. Do you want to be made well? And he responds with this long litany of complaints. Oh, I don't have anybody to help me. And it's so far to the pool. And I can't get in there before somebody else does. And uh, Jesus says, stand up, take up your mat, and walk. And he does. But usually, you know, in these stories, the person who has been healed uh, is said to rejoice or to go on his way praising God or, or something like that. Not this guy. He just took up his mat and walked. Now, we didn't hear the next part of the story. But what happens next in the story is that the authorities see this man carrying his mat and they accuse him of working on the Sabbath. He replies that he was told to carry his mat by the man who had healed him. Well, who was that, they say. Well, I didn't catch his name, the guy says. But then later, he does meet Jesus again uh, and finds out his name and finds out who he is and where he's from and immediately runs and rats Jesus out to the authorities. Knowing knowing that he is causing a great deal of trouble for this man who has healed him. Handicapped or healed, not a happy man or a grateful one. Now, I don't know if gratitude leads to happiness or if happiness leads to gratitude. I, I, I suspect it works both ways. But I do know that gratitude is an essential element of happiness. The man in today's story was neither happy nor grateful, even though his circumstances had changed for the better. The reading in Revelation is about a place of happiness. Now, we have to be careful when reading the Revelation. As Reverend Shelley said last week, it's couched in, in dream language, in vision language, in, in symbolic language. You know, I don't really believe that heaven is a, is, a, is, a, is a city with streets of gold and pearly gates. At least, I hope it's not. I really don't want to spend eternity in a huge metropolitan area. Not my idea of heaven at all. But when reading passages like this, to ask, well, is that really true? Is it really like that? That is always the wrong question. The right question to ask is, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, when, when this was written a thousand years ago, a walled city was a place, two, sorry, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> I'm not that old. Uh, <clears throat> a walled city was a place of refuge, a place of safety, a refuge from marauding bandits and invading armies. And well into the Middle Ages even, 
uh, rural people flocked to the nearest city at the first sign of trouble. And then there's all that gold and those precious stones that are used as construction materials. Well, when that was written, there was no social safety net. People struggled to get by. Life was hard, very uncertain. The wealth of heaven symbolizes comfort and relief from that ongoing daily struggle to get by. The walls of the city keep out what John calls the vile and the deceitful. No scammers allowed. No crooks, no bullies, no liars, no cheaters, no abusers. Heaven is a place of security where there are no predators and therefore no victims. So, heaven is a place of happiness, of safety, of security, of comfort, of all of that. And it's a place of light. According to John, the city has no need of sun or moon because God's glory is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. You know, if you struggle to understand the doctrine of the Incarnation, the idea that Jesus is fully human and fully divine at the same time, you'll never get a better image than that, that Jesus is a lamp. And you might picture your living room lamp or your bedside lamp. I I think about an old-fashioned kerosene lantern myself. But Jesus is the lamp. And the light that shines in that lamp, that shines from that lamp, is the light that is God. That's a great image. One that's important for me anyway. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to reflect that light so that it can be seen by those around us. Well, and then there are the gates. I promised to get back to the 12 gates. Hmm. You don't have to be an expert in medieval warfare to know that the weakest part of a city's defense, a walled city's defenses, are the gates. I mean, how many movies have you seen where they're using the battery rams to smash down the city gates? So walled cities tend to have as few gates as possible. Only one, really, if they can get away with that. But the city of heaven has 12 gates. Wow. Why would that be? And clearly, defense is not an issue. So why so many gates? I think it's for ease of access. I think it's so that people can come and go as they please. And remember, of course, <clears throat> this city isn't up in the clouds. It's down on earth. You know, we're used to seeing heaven in, in cartoons and in movies as being surrounded by puffy white clouds and, and St. Peter in front of the one gate, you know. That's not what John says. He says the city is here on earth and there are 12 gates. If heaven has to be a city, I'm glad I'll be able to step through one of those gates and go for a walk maybe to look for crocuses along the riverbank or to see the, the trees bursting into, into leaf, filling out with leaves, or enjoy the, the green that has followed that, that rain we had the other day. All of that. Hmm. The thought of all of that makes me happy. And when I'm happy, I sing. Twelve gates to the city, hallelujah. Let's all sing, shall we? We're going to sing something. I forget what it is now. Um, like, a healing like a healing stream, yes. Talk about the pool of water. Wade in the water. Healing stream.
thought that maybe I just picked that, maybe we just sang that like really recently, did we? Okay, when I, when I picked it, I thought, no, we sang that in a different church, but uh, anyway. I like it anyway, I don't mind if we sing it twice. I hope you don't mind either. Okay. Let's gather ourselves together in prayer. God of grace and goodness, we gather before you this morning in grateful thanksgiving. Among the many blessings of our lives, we give thanks for every beat of our hearts, every breath we take, for those we love and those who love us, for the freedoms we enjoy and the responsibilities that accompany them, for the health and happiness that are ours, for the beauty that surrounds us in nature and in each other, for the simple comforts of life, for the hopes and dreams that sustain us and the fond memories that warm our hearts. For all this and more, we give thanks and bless your holy name. And yet we know that not all is well in the world. We pray for those who grieve and we think particularly of Louise Carr and her family and all who mourn the death of Jack Carr. We pray for those who face medical appointments or tests or procedures and for those who live with illness or injury. We pray for those who struggle to make ends meet or who suffer the effects of addiction and for those who have lost their way in life. On this Victoria Day weekend, we pray for Queen Elizabeth II and for her family. We pray for other world leaders that they may move us toward peace and prosperity. And we pray for those in Ukraine and elsewhere whose lives are torn apart by violence, oppression, hatred, and greed. We pray for a world in which happiness abounds. Also, we pray for those who are traveling on this long weekend and for those who are who are suffering because of the storm in Michigan, and Ontario, and Quebec. These prayers and the secret longings of our hearts, we dare to hold you before you because of Jesus, our model of compassion and courage. And together we join in the prayer that he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, one of the ways we have of uh, showing our gratitude um, is to uh, is to share the resources that uh, that we enjoy, uh, and you can see on the screen many ways to uh, to give uh, to, for the work of this congregation, uh, and of course there are many other opportunities uh, for you to give in in other parts of your lives as well. I commend the spiritual gift of generosity to you.
And just a quick look at the... Oh, I forgot, uh, forgot in the celebrations to, uh, to mention the appointment of three new professors and the renewal of the principal at St. Andrew's College. That's great. Okay. At this point then, go in peace. And as you go, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May, may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go in peace, my friends. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad. I'm singing hallelujah. Oh, singing hallelujah. Singing hallelujah. We will rejoice and be glad. I'm singing hallelujah. Oh, singing hallelujah. Singing hallelujah. We will rejoice. And be glad. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad. I'm singing hallelujah. Oh, singing hallelujah. Singing hallelujah. We will rejoice and be glad. Yeah, so it's I'm in stone teaching stone bridge.